Hi, Dragonflies. Welcome back to Dragonfly Spirit Studio. I'm Lynn Bauer. In the last several videos, we've been working on coming up with a painting based on a photo of a lighthouse that isn't a copy of the photo. We took a simple design strategy that I call the silhouette painting strategy, where the only information we pulled out of that photo was the silhouette of the lighthouse. And then we used that silhouette and imagination and memory and other resources to come up with two different designs for paintings that we might base on this photo of the lighthouse. Then in the last video, we tried to take those designs and actually figure out painting plans for each one of them. What would we do, in what order, and how would we do it to get to the finished painting? This step of coming up with a painting plan isn't really necessary in a lot of opaque media. We can just kind of squint our eyes and see the big middle value shapes and put those down first, and then we can layer light and dark shapes on top of that to add our smaller details and expand our value range and adjust our edges. So we can kind of figure out our painting on the fly. In watercolor, this business of having to come up with a painting plan mostly comes from the need for us to know where we're going to reserve white and light areas and not cover them up accidentally because it's difficult for us to get them back. When we started coming up with the painting plans, we discovered that the first design that we came up with that we thought was simpler was actually a bit more challenging because it was going to be more difficult to reserve the lights in that particular painting. In this video, we're going to talk about what makes it not too hard and a little harder and really hard to reserve lights in watercolors. It's good to be able to recognize these situations so you don't beat yourself up if you just happen to be running into one of those really challenging situations. And also so you can look at potential paintings with an eye to whether you can design your way around those problems. How important are those light areas? Can you make some adjustments to make the situation a bit less challenging? Would it help to change the scale or adjust the color scheme? How important is it to you to use just watercolor? Would you consider using other media to get the look that you want? Sometimes you need to make a trade-off between the look that you'd like to have and how much work it will be to get that look and what skills you have right now. In this video, we're going to look at when is it easy to reserve whites and lights in watercolor, when does it get a little more challenging, and when is it really hard? And then we'll talk about when it is really hard, what can we do about that? So the easiest situation of all is when your light or white shapes consist of a large sky or background or foreground areas that are mostly uniform. Or if there is any variation, the shapes don't have to be all that precise. And then the shapes that are going to get layered on top have colors that are related to whatever colors were used in those light background areas. And this doesn't apply just to landscapes. It can also be simple paintings in which the background is just suggested or there's not even a background at all. Not every painting needs a background. When you're ready for a tiny step up from that, the best thing to do is look for something that's almost like that easiest situation and has just a few lights that need to be reserved, but the position and size and shape doesn't matter much. In this painting, the edges of the clouds are actually lighter than the sky or the shadows on the clouds. And there are some little lights left on the shoreline and in the trees in the background to suggest buildings or something, but it doesn't really matter exactly what shape the clouds are or exactly where those little shapes are left for the buildings. We saw another example of this in the last video when we were talking about our default sequence for painting things in watercolor. The white edges of the clouds don't have to be in any particular place. And the little lights that became the road and the buildings in the foreground were just accidents that we exploited. So if you're new to watercolor or new to reserving lights, think about looking for situations where the white areas add a lot of interest but don't have to be a specific shape or location or where you can use accidental lights to suggest something without spelling it out completely. This is a lot easier than just taking a photo and saying, I'm going to paint whatever I see in this photo. 
So for example, if I were going to do a postcard based on a scene like this, instead of worrying about trying to mask out or paint around tiny little barns and silos in the distance, I could use the same strategy I used in the previous example and simply skip around some light areas to suggest there are some buildings in this rural location. Because mostly this is about the light coming out and hitting the fields and that intense green. Next up in level of difficulty is reserving some lights that do actually require a little planning, but don't present any huge challenges. So this is a situation where we have large, relatively regular light or white shapes. They're not embedded in the middle of a graduated wash or some other complicated wash. Although as long as the shapes are regular enough, that can be dealt with by masking them. And the colors of those light shapes are either white or related to the colors that are going to be layered on top. So for example, in this painting, the edges that are adjacent to that largest wash that's going to be the most difficult to control are nice hard edges that are relatively simple and we can paint around them fairly easily. In areas where we do have an edge that's going to be softened a bit, we're working on a fairly small shape at that point, so it's not terribly difficult. And where we do have the situation of complementary colors, the edges are pretty regular, and where we want them a little softened, we've cheated a little bit with the color so that the green isn't really right against the red. Instead, there's sort of a buffer zone of yellow, which is part of the green, and then orange, which is part of the red, to allow us to make that transition and not see muddy brown or gray tones. And don't overlook the power of placement on the page to help you deal with things you need to paint around too. This would be much more difficult if we showed the entire subject instead of having it run off the page here and there and had to keep that dark background going all the way around the page without letting the edge dry on us. Breaking it up into smaller shapes allows us to deal with it more easily and also gives a more interesting composition. Next, we have a situation that's challenging, but can be done with some strategic design. And that's where we have light or white shapes that have many soft, broken, or irregular edges. And for these soft edge shapes, it's actually a problem if they are in a graduated wash or a large flat wash. It's actually easier if the wash around them is broken up so that we can sort of lay it a little at a time. But the colors of the light shapes are either white or they're still related to or components of what we're going to layer on top. So notice how once again we've used the large regular shapes of the leaves to kind of break up that background area and allow us to deal with these frilly edges one small area at a time. And then where the frilly petals cross that tangle of leaves, we basically build the edge of the petal a little at a time as we paint the green areas that are adjacent to it. And since the petal edge is white, we can get away with this again without having to worry about complementary colors. So that white sort of forms a buffer zone between the reds in the center of the petal and the green of the leaves. In this example, notice again that we've engineered some hard edged stems and leaves and so forth to break up the background and allow us to work on those frilly edges of the petals a little at a time. And where we have these rounded shapes where it's important to get the roundness, what's behind them is sort of a blob of out of focus color that's related to the color we're dealing with. So we don't have to worry about the complementary color issue. And because the background is just sort of out of focus blobs, we can put our attention on getting that rounded shape that we're trying to suggest. So an example like this might require some ingenuity in arranging things on the page to break it up into manageable chunks. And it might take some care and patience to develop the areas a little at a time. But really the most challenging thing about this painting was originally <laughs> the sky was blue on the day that I was visiting this um, botanical park. 
And I knew that that was going to be a problem to have blue next to all that yellow or yellow green. I was going to have trouble with getting that out of focus background to just kind of disappear. So I simply changed the blue sky to sort of fade into a very pale yellow because I felt as though that didn't really add enough to the story to make it worth the trouble it was going to cause me. So that brings us to the situation we encountered with design one of our lighthouse plans. Light shapes that have many soft, broken, or irregular edges. They're embedded or next to a graduated wash or a large flat wash. And the colors of the light shapes are not components of the darker colors to be layered on top. In this case, they're complements. It's also a problem if, for example, we're trying to paint things like yellow birch or aspen trees against a bright blue sky, we may wind up with green leaves around the edge where we wanted that bright yellow and blue contrast. And I'm not going to show you a lot of examples of that because typically what I try to do is design my way around that problem so that I don't have things like the turquoise and orange adjacent to each other in the foreground water in this scene or the sort of violet tones in the clouds and the yellow up above. Although in that area, you'll see I have engineered that buffer zone of sort of a warm golden color and then a warm gray and then the violet. So in the sky, although there is sort of an illusion that there's yellow next to blue violet, it actually isn't immediately adjacent. But this painting was a real chore to paint. So I think it taught me to see if I could figure out ways to avoid this situation in watercolor. But let's suppose that you're just determined this is the painting you'd like to create. What options do we have open to us? So here's a roundup of the kinds of things we might do to deal with reserving or recovering whites and lights in watercolor. We can paint around them, negative painting, on either wet or dry paper, depending on whether we want soft edges or hard edges. We can use masks or resists, like masking tape, masking fluid, frisket film, gum arabic wax. We can lift paint while it's still wet using a thirsty brush or a paper towel, something like that. We can lift dry paint by re-wetting the paint and blotting it off or even scrubbing aggressively if that's your thing. We can use opaque media. If you're not a transparent watercolor purist, you might decide to use gouache, acrylic, pastel, something like that. We could make stylistic changes. If the problem is soft edges and we're willing to give that up in order to keep the bright contrast of complementary colors, we might just use hard edged areas of flatter color, kind of a graphic design look, or we might decide to build the image up from small marks in a pointillist or impressionistic way. And then we can always change the design. We can ask ourselves, how important is it <laughs> to have the soft edge shapes and the complementary colors? Is it worth the amount of effort we're going to have to put into trying to find a way to do that? Or can we change the design to eliminate that problem and still keep what we want to express in the painting? Now, this video is about design and planning, so we're not going to get involved in the technical details of how to do all those methods of reserving whites and lights. I've already made videos about that. I'll put links down in the video description to the videos that I have about using those various methods, and you can look that up later. For now, let's stay focused on what we're trying to do. We were trying to come up with a painting plan for this design that we had, and we ran into this problem of these soft-edged light shapes and complementary colors right next to each other. So we're trying to figure out how to deal with that problem. And we have a variety of options, and we don't know right now which one might work and which one won't work. So this is where I like to use that sub-painting idea that I told you about in an earlier video. I don't need to paint the entire painting to find out whether things are at least feasible, maybe in the ballpark, totally 
out of the question. <laughs> so I'm going to try to make a first pass with just the little section right around the island. So I'm imagining that my finished painting is going to be 12 by 16. And I've taken just the section of the design that would be where the lighthouse and the island is and drawn that out on another sheet of paper. And it turns out that that would fit nicely on a little five by seven. So my sub paintings, I did a few even smaller sections of just the end of the island. And then I did some sub paintings that are about five by seven. So these are roughly the size that this actually would be in the finished painting. So in the upper two tiny examples here, I was just playing with whether I could maybe apply masking fluid with an irregular enough edge that I would be willing to lose having a really soft edge if it were broken up enough. And then in the bottom two, I was trying methods of laying down yellow over the whole area and coming back with a blue violet on top. In the lower right, I really don't like that. That's where I tried to layer on top with just transparent watercolor, and I get those sort of brownish tones. It doesn't have any glow. The one in the lower right actually has some potential. What I did was I went ahead and laid yellow over the whole area, and then I added some white to my blue-violet wash to make it somewhat opaque. It's not really opaque enough. It comes out more like a gray sort of stormy sky, but I'm filing that away for future reference because it's got a little of the blue violet tinge. This could be useful for another painting, or it might actually work if I put a little bit more white in the wash or used gouache instead of watercolor for the sky. Next, I tried just drawing outlines around all the interesting shapes and coloring them in. And this isn't horrible. It would be okay if I were travel sketching. I think I'd be okay with this, but it's not the look I'm after. So I abandoned that one. Next, I went back to the masking fluid method and tried to do it just with a little bit more care. And I left myself a little sort of a white halo around things as a buffer zone between the yellow and the blue violet to see if I could get that glow to come out a little bit more. I like the way the water worked quite a bit in this one, and I discovered in the process of doing this that if I left some light areas in the water and dropped my golds into that, it works out fine because those colors don't need to be quite so bright. They just need to echo the colors above. The little light squiggles on the water surface and the little bit of white right along the shoreline are little squiggles of masking fluid. So I kind of feel like with this one, the water is working pretty well. I feel like I've got a method that I would use for the water. So from now on out, I'm kind of focusing on what am I going to do with the lighthouse itself and those trees. This was my attempt at what if I tried building up the whole image out of small marks, sort of an impressionistic or pointillist style. And I can tell right away as I started working on this that this is not my thing and I would never do an entire 12 by 16 this way. But I did like what happened in the sky with these overlapping brush marks and especially varying them from smaller ones close to the horizon to larger ones farther out. I don't care for it for this painting, but I'm definitely filing it away as an interesting textural sort of feature I could use in another painting. Then I tried another stylistic change. What if I painted this the way I might paint something as a quick sketch in the field, where instead of trying to have soft edges, I'm using irregular edges and large areas of mostly flat, kind of bold color. And I actually like this one quite a lot, and that probably partly reflects the fact that I have a little more practice with doing this, so I pulled it off a little better than I had some of the other ones. But I also confirm that I don't really need to keep those pure colors in the water. Here, a lot of the water is fairly grayed, but it still works. It reads as a reflection, and it doesn't need to have that really bright gold that I want in the trees. And then I did another one, sort of the same idea, but just with somewhat more muted colors. And then finally, I have the little gouache painting that I did earlier. So now I can lay them all out and take a step back and reflect on 
how they look and also how it felt to do the work, whether I think I could pull it off, whether I enjoyed it, what's the trade-off between the amount of effort I had to put in and the look that I get out of it, how well do I think I can translate it to a bigger painting. So what did I decide? What's the painting plan for Design 1? Well, to be honest, my favorite of the little sub-paintings is the gouache sketch. This particular situation where you have soft-edged, light shapes that you don't want to have the colors mingle, either because they're complementary colors or they would produce a third color that you don't want to see in that area, it's not something that watercolor just naturally wants to do. But it's pretty easy to pull off in opaque media. I started painting in watercolor because I like the things that watercolor does all on its own, the gifts that it will give us if we allow it to kind of have its own say. So I'm not really excited about doing paintings where I have to kind of force things to happen in watercolor just to paint it in watercolor. People send me photos all the time and say, tell me how to paint this in watercolor. And for me, that question is backwards. I want to create something that says something about what I'm trying to express, but that uses watercolor and its natural tendencies to do that. So if watercolor doesn't naturally suit the subject, I'll use a different medium. You might make a different choice. You might care about all your paintings being in transparent watercolor, in which case you might feel differently about this. So in the next video, we will come up with a painting plan for design one in transparent watercolor. And I will make a first draft of it and you'll see it goes horribly wrong. And I wanted to do that as well because I've put together these videos in what I hope is kind of a logical sequence so you can see how the pieces of the planning process fit together from the initial idea to thinking through and brainstorming different designs to trying to take those designs and turn them into actual plans to actual execution. I did that so that you could see the big picture, but that's not how it works in my studio. I am definitely the person that wants to jump in there and start painting before I really have all my ducks in a row. So I work in drafts. Very often I do some planning and I think, okay, I got this figured out and I jump in and I get partway through and I realize, oh wait, um, <laughs> there's one more thing I have to figure out. Or I realize that I didn't practice something as much as I needed to, to really pull it off. So I always hope that the draft that I'm working on is the final draft, but I also always allow myself permission to say, you know what, if I started again on a fresh sheet of paper, I could have a much better outcome. So I don't force myself to fix up things or fiddle more with the particular piece of paper. If it's gone wrong, I just get another piece of paper and start fresh. That's something that you'll have to decide about in terms of personality. Some people feel like that's boring to go back and try to do the same painting again. I feel like it's liberating because I don't have to execute the painting on that particular piece of paper. So it takes a little of the stress off me. I do my best, but if I could do better on another sheet of paper, then I will. So in the next video, we'll have a look at that. And if you're feeling like I would never do all of this planning before I started painting, that's okay. I'm right there with you. <laughs> you have to figure out what works for you. Hopefully now you see how all the pieces fit together. And what you can do is just go back to whatever stage needs some attention, give it the attention that it needs, and then move forward again. So I hope you'll give this a try with some of your own paintings. In the next video, you'll get to see me kind of crash and burn with the first plan. And then maybe we'll move on and try another draft. I'm not sure how much time we'll have in the next video. But give it a try. Have fun with it. And I'll see you next time. Happy painting.